This is John Spink, Director of the Food Fraud Initiative at Michigan State University and an Assistant Professor in the College of Veterinary Medicine. This is my presentation of, for Food Safety Americas, the BRC Conference here in Nashville, Tennessee. The title is Non-Traditional Food Safety, the Evolution of Food Fraud Prevention. First off, to give a brief introduction of Michigan State University, we're a research group focused on policy and strategy only. We don't have a testing lab. We don't uh, have information technology, uh, data gathering, or anything. We focus only on the implementation of the focus areas in food fraud. Our, our curriculum is developed in a circle. You'll see down here outreach, research, and education. So me being here at this conference is outreach. And while I'm here, I've already learned some new questions. So that'll go back and lead to new research. And that leads then into graduate courses that we teach. That's education. And then that information also feeds back into outreach. Our primary outreach um, course is our, our MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. There's our free open and online. Uh, the first one's a food fraud overview MOOC, oft offered May and November live lectures, and then uh, recorded for uh, viewing throughout the year. And then we have a food fraud audit guide MOOC. They're usually offered monthly. Emphasize free. The content is always free for our MOOCs. So you can share them with anybody and everybody. Um, and we have near inf infinite capacity. So the content's free. We do charge $100 for a certificate of completion. There's also a food defense audit guide. So this is similar concepts of the intentional acts, but uh, focused on food defense, intentional acts for harm. That's also usually offered monthly. We have a new food fraud vulnerability assessment and food fraud prevention strategy development MOOC. This is the first time we've offered it, and it will be June 18th, 25th, and July 2nd. So there will be three two-hour lectures for this uh, new MOOC. Then we also conduct exec executive education. These are courses held on-site at Michigan State or around the country, possibly around the world. Um, we cover some of these topics in detail, looking at uh, basically conducting vulnerability assessments, the basic background of food fraud, and then looking at um, the prevention strategy development. We also uh, conduct courses on quantifying food risk. We have graduate courses. So we have all online. These are real Michigan State graduate courses offered online for three credits. We have five of them that relate to food fraud in one way or another. Um, and if you take four of those courses, you can earn a graduate certificate in food fraud prevention. And this, again, is all online. Um, these courses are education and ba built on uh, the idea to, to help um, people who are going to be leading food fraud prevention programs and feel like they want to have a good, a good baseline to start from. And these credits uh, from these graduate courses can all roll into an online master's in food safety from Michigan State. This is a real Michigan State master's course. And also, we have a certificate in international food law that's related. First off, to quickly uh, thank our food fraud think tank. Um, so we'd like to support, support the members here. Um, so they're brand owners. Um, we've got Dannon, Mars, Cargill, Wegmans, Mondelez, Hershey's, and now Woolworths from Australia. And really, they fund us to help support our mission uh, standardizing prevention practices, and really to help us lead strategy and policy, and I'll say internally and externally at their companies. So having a center point like this helps to emphasize that food fraud is a real thing, but also then um, bring those, those external resources internally to help with the development. Deliverables that we've had along the way include uh, expanded engagement, such as with Codex or ISO. This is really important because these aren't funded by the conferences to travel, and if we're not there, we can't hear what's going on, and we can't have an influence on the discussions. Our Food Fraud Audit Guide MOOC and now our Vulnerability Assessment and Prevention Strategy Development MOOCs, they really came from the think tank. These were uh, identified as unmet needs, and they were developed with the think tank member insight and uh, put into the marketplace, especially having the free content, which is excellent for sharing with suppliers around the world. We also have a range of expanded online on-demand resources, such as on YouTube, such as this. I'm recording this for YouTube, um, so it'll be up public. And industry benchmarking surveys. We started to do more um, perspective on what are, what are people doing and uh, um, understanding those best practices. So thank you to our think tank funders. <laughs> I love this slide, uh, and for a while I didn't have it back in, but I've, I've got it back in. So this is for real. Um, when we're dealing with food safety, um, we're, we're not dealing with intelligent adversaries, and we are with counterfeiting and food fraud. So counterfeiters attend anti-counterfeit conferences. Now, it would be illogical for them not to study what we do. 
because they're making millions on us. So for them to understand the types of testing technologies, the tracing that we have, then start to find ways to innovate around us. The question is not if we'll stop them. The question is how will they circumvent our control systems. Before we get started, it's always important to uh, look at food, the food risks overall and, f and how to frame food fraud within that overall uh, matrix. A key is for a company. A company is responsible and accountable for managing all types of food risks, not just one aspect, not just adulterant substances, not just from ingredients, for all risks. We need to understand the motivation. If we're trying to prevent it, we need to understand the motivation. We're not trying to catch food fraud. We're trying to prevent it from occurring in the first place. Food safety and food defense are two topics that are very familiar and, 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 and well-known, and we were working in those areas um, through our Michigan State work and worked the state of Michigan and others. And when we started to look at prevention, when we looked at this whole issue of food fraud, we found that it was fundamentally different. And it's fundamentally different for a lot of reasons that we will get into. Uh, to fill out the, the overall concept here is to look at food quality. Most of these groups are managed under a quality insurance concept or group, but also this is really based on quality management systems. So you would look at uh, conducting a risk assessment um, and then um, identifying the hazards that are, that are bad and then, then mitigating and preventing those hazards. The column on the left is unintentional. We did not try to create these acts. The column on the right is intentional. The bad guys know what they, di what they did and know why they did it. For food defense, the intent is harm. That's public health, economic, or terror. They're trying to harm someone else. For food fraud, the motivation is economic gain for themselves. And it, this is real key for themselves. They want to conduct an act and not get caught. So they'll try to be a lot more sneaky uh, to get into the system. Now, one thing we've seen in food defense, and especially in Europe now, after a number of the incidents there, is terrorism. There's more of a focus on terrorism. Terrorism is a bit of a tricky word to use because there's sometimes very specific definitions, such as the US FBI defining terrorism as being someone that's a, a part of a known um, terrorist organization. So someone like Timothy McVeigh, the Oklahoma City bomber here in the US, would not technically fall under that definition of a terrorist. Now, we would all consider him a domestic terrorist and an act of terror against our country, but it might not fit into that definition. The US FDA avoided any challenges or concerns or with that with, by uh, focusing their, the intentional adulteration ru rule on wide-scale harm. So wide-scale harm is, is more narrow than all food defense, but broader than terrorism. For a company and addressing food, GFSI as well, they must be addressing all types of food defense. So when we look at each type of, of food risks, you see that on this matrix everything is covered. The last point is to look at economically motivated adulteration. Now this is a term that's sometimes been confused with food fraud. And the key is that if you're dealing with the US FDA, you should use the US FDA terminology. And the US FDA, um, and this is referenced and cited again by Dr. Ostroff, uh, head of Office of Foods, is that economically motivated adulteration is a substance for economic, um, economic gain, which is a subcategory of food fraud. And we notice the reference and cited there is Dr. Ostroff actually used the food risk matrix, citing our works to explain the difference between food fraud, EMA, and all the type of food risks. It's interesting to look at the different terminology. And um, one work project that we did with the Grocery Manufacturers Association, GMA, as well as some other colleagues on a, on a work group there, is did a survey, international survey of food fraud and related terminology. And, and what we found is that of the respondents, 50% identified food fraud as the most efficient term for deception for economic gain using food. Second was economically motivated adulteration with 15%. But one thing that was interesting there is when we, we cross-referenced the people who responded to this with their definitions of food fraud and their scope, as they identified in later questions, that there really were multiple definitions of EMA. And they, in, in about half the cases, used the US definition, which would be a much more narrow scope. Then other terms used were food protection, food integrity, food authenticity, and food crime. We see in Europe food integrity is used a lot, and there's, there's several food authenticity projects looking at the, the process to identify and confirm that product is what it says it is. So our work with GMA was to first look at this baseline, and then from there we'll have other types of work to build on that to help share information and uh, clarify the definition and scope. GFSI history of food fraud prevention. So 
it was interesting to look back to see where and how we got where we are today. So people like BRC are aligned with the GFSI food safety management system and benchmarking requirements. So it's good to look back at the history of how things started. For us, at Michigan State in 2011 is when we first had any interaction really with GFSI from our, our food fraud group. And this was at some meetings that were at MSU. And that really get, got us thinking about the possibility of GFSI in, introduced. In 2011, we published our first article defining food fraud. A key here is that we did not develop the term, we didn't create the term, but we were the first to have it be the source of an academic journal article and source of research on the definitions. So this was the first time that it would be considered that food fraud was defined in an academic sense in a, in a journal. In 2011, GFSI issued their guidance document number six, and it, it did not have food fraud in it uh, specifically, but started to look at broader health hazards. In 2012, so shortly after that was published, GFSI created a food fraud think tank. And our group, Michigan State, I was one of four of the original members, six, six total, uh, that, that then were put together to review what was food fraud and if or how it would be uh, um, uh, addressed under GFSI. In the midst of that, the horse meat incident occurred in 2013. This created a lot of focus and uh, um, um, activity when we're looking at the, the real, realization of what food fraud could do as an economic and public health impact. Then in G 2014, GFSI took the um, um, insight from the, the food fraud think tank and published a GFSI position paper on food fraud. Now a key is GFSI has explained and defined their direction on food fraud since at least 2014. So food fraud prevention and the requirements should not be a surprise. In 2017, GFSI issued the guidance document uh, version 7, which had explicit and defined food fraud vulnerability assessment and prevention plan requirements. As of 2018, compliance was required. So essentially, in 2011, from an academic sense, food fraud, there is such a thing as food fraud. In 2012, food fraud is an idea, really an idea that, that should be acted upon. And then food fraud was really conceived at this point in 2014, it became very real that there were going to be re compliance requirements coming uh, that, were, that were pending uh, to deal with food fraud. And really in 2018, when the requirements, say about uh, 20 or 22 weeks ago, food fraud was born. Now consider this, HACCP is over 22 years in development for food safety. Food fraud is only 22 weeks uh, in, 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 in development. So what we do right now is really get the process started and that's a real key we can't expect it to be as robust or thorough or intense as a as a HACCP plan because it's really just so new we'll know a lot more in 22 more weeks in 22 months and definitely in 22 years what we have here in May is <laughs> reality strikes so now they're starting to be audits and specifically audit nonconformances and this is a problem because a nonconformance for food fraud is a nonconformance for all GFSI requirements and for, for the food safety management system. So to address that in part, it also in May 2018, GFSI created and published a GFSI food fraud technical document. So this is a new uh, a clarity, uh, clarification and details of food fraud and what GFSI is expecting now and along the way in the future. I'll review that in more detail now. So first off, the announcement was, was May 9th, well, I say, <laughs> It's not uh, 3018, it's 2018, so I'll catch that. Uh, uh, good luck, or, or your wish that it would be a thousand years from now. But uh, uh, they announced it um, uh, on May 9th, and they had a food fraud review and a blog and a technical report. So there was a blog post that announced that they were, they were talking about food fraud uh, and updating it, and then there was this tackling food fraud through food safety management systems. The key here is there's nothing new. GFSI is just uh, confirming what has been published in the past and their expectations and really just clarifying that, but also addressing some new questions that have been out there. So I won't go into great detail, but um, that's, that's a document that's definitely important to review um, if you're addressing uh, food fraud for the first time. At the Food Safety Summit, uh, Jillian Kelleher, Vice Chair, uh, also uh, Vice President at Wegmans, presented the GFSI perspective uh, on these uh, new food fraud requirements. And really key here is that it was, she was representing GFSI, speaking on their behalf, so she's representing authority. And really what we see in here is a lot of familiar concepts. First off, GFSI, a key here in the middle is the board. 
So you, you'll notice the arrows come in and the arrow that comes out of the GFSI board is mandate. And that's a real key that these GFSI requirements um, are people recommend, such as technical working groups or other, st other stakeholders make recommendations to the GFSI board, but GFSI makes the decision and GS GFSI decided that food fraud is, the GFSI board decided that GFSI, uh, that food fraud will be a compliance requirement. And you'll notice, again, some similar uh, slides in there. This is a, a variation of the food risk matrix, looking at how food fraud is different than the other types of food risks. Terminology, so this addresses all types of fraud, uh, um, the, from substitution, counterfeiting, uh, unapproved enhancements, gray market, counterfeiting, mislabeling, and others. And also, uh, it was reiterated about the food safety management system that GFSI requires three separate assessments and three separate prevention plans under and integrated with the food safety management system. So HACCP is one, TASIP for, for food defense, uh, a threat assessment is, is uh, separate, and then food fraud, a vulnerability assessment, or VASIP is a separate uh, um, assessment and a separate prevention plan. So one thing that GFSI covered that was really interesting, and this was, this was a further clarity uh, of previous comments, is what requires a control. There's a, cons there, there's a really key point here that a vulnerability is not always a risk. If you leave your front door unlocked, it doesn't mean that the, there's a statistical probability increase of any kind that you'll get robbed today versus yesterday. So it's, a vulnerability is not always a risk. A risk is not always a hazard that requires a preventive control. So a key with what we've seen from GFSI is there's this real focus on identifying the vulnerabilities to food fraud and then assessing which ones are the worst which ones are risks, and then, then even beyond that, which ones are hazards that require a preventive control. So that's a real key, that we want to identify as many vulnerabilities as possible, but that doesn't mean if you identify 100 new vulner vulnerabilities that you need 100 new control plans. Each vulnerability does not require preventive control, but monitor. And that's a key. You want to identify these vulnerabilities, such as locking your front door, and if you get new information, such as break-ins in the neighborhood, or uh, just uh, things that are, that are dangerous, then you might decide that at this point you should start locking your front door. And that's why you want to monitor. So GFSI really focused on this concept of a hierarchy. And we've got vulnerability that then could lead to a risk, that could lead to a hazard, that could at least lead to a hazard requiring a prevent preventive control. So again, a real key here is you want to identify the vulnerabilities to be able to conduct those risk assessments. And you conduct the risk assessments to identify the hazards that do require preventive control. The level of effort, top down or bottom up, this is a real key. We see this as a challenge with a lot of food safety managers that are dealing with food fraud and other types of crime, criminal acts or intentional acts, is a traditional um, um, way of gathering a lot of information, uh, say at the front level, at, the, at the, uh, the, man the manufacturing line or in the facility, and then gathering that information together to, make, to draw some conclusions. So we look here, it really depends on the process and the root cause. Again, when we're dealing with things that possibly like food fraud, the, the purchasing or the requirements and, and um, um, controls, decisions may be made at the corporate level. If something like a spice is bought corporate-wise and then distributed to all your plants, then really each plant doesn't have a specific control plan. The process is and the root cause would be at that global level. So it's a challenge to look at facility-based or enterprise-based. What we've seen is that food safety is this enterprise or facility-based uh, system where you're gathering a lot of information and controls at the front line and then uh, assessing and consolidating those, those risks or insights as you move up. Food fraud is opposite, where we really are looking at the broad enterprise-wide, enterprise-based risks, vulnerabilities, and then we're synthesizing them down to specific ones that apply to a specific facility. And a lot of times we see facilities really don't have very much of a role in food fraud prevention other than just monitoring the product that's, that's in their current facility. So this is the difference between that top-down and bottom-up assessment. Uh, on, on May 16th, last week, we published a food fraud initiative review of that new uh, food, GFSI food fraud technical document. So you can see our website for more information and the blog post. Um, we go through point by point, detail by detail, um, assessment probably more than you've ever wanted, but that's how we have to build up to reach our conclusions. First off, holistic scope, all fraud and all products. So the scope is all types of fraud from adulterant substances to counterfeits and stolen goods and all products, including incoming goods through to product in the marketplace, including counterfeits. 
All types of fraud and all products can cause health hazards and lead to economic harm. So a question in the past has been of whether there's certain types of hazards that need to be assessed or not. A key is yes, they do. This is also consistent with the Food Safety Modernization Act, which under their hazard analysis section does state that a hazard analysis must be documented regardless of the outcome. And FISMA also points out that it could be from intentional acts such as, such as economic act, economically motivated acts. So a key is that you, you do need, in these broad level assessments anyway, cover all fraud and all products. Just get started. There's continued emphasis in the blog post and in the new technical paper. There's continued emphasis on sta starting the process that will be supported by continuous improvement and sharing of best practices. A key here is that some of these assessments will be very, seem uncertain and unrobust compared to what we've done for, for HACCP. But again, that, that's key to just get started. We're going from point A to point B before we get to point Z. And GFSI reiterates this in the report. Auditors are to confirm, confirm the process, not judge the plans. So GFSI has been really clear about this um, previously in the documents and then, then did do a good job of restating their intent here. Really to begin compliance, the scope is to confirm the process has started. And that's a real important point that we need to at least get get going in the process and I can tell you from personal experience and looking at at the room here is that um, it's a hot topic and so that's the key GFSI you companies you need to have food fraud being addressed holistically and that's what's happening note a or the reference statement of GFSI thinking so what we say is that this is a reference and possibly the reference for uh, the statement of what GFSI's expectations are so this is a very important document to review and uh, uh, build your systems around the food fraud bottom line. <laughs> Engage social science and business decision making. So these are two ends of the spectrum that really as food scientists we have very limited experience. So the social science is that the bad guy, the human adversary, is, a, is, is, is this criminal. They're, they're, they're intelligent adversaries and we really need to follow the experts in the field which is crime science and criminology. Specifically they look at situational crime prevention. The other end is business decision making. So say you conduct a vulnerability assessment and you get a risk of rank of high. Well, does your, does your CFO need to act at that point? And that's, a, that's an important question to, to see what is the decision making process internally and how much should you invest in any type of countermeasure or not. Of course, if a food fraud incident occurs, that's bad, but how bad? If you're the senior manager that gets that information, do you then call your boss? Do you call the crisis management team? Do you recommend that your boss alerts the board of directors now? Or is this something where you have enough controls in place that the, even though this new incident is bad, it's, it's not really something to, to worry about? That, that, it's not, that new vulnerability is, doesn't work its way to be a new hazard that requires a preventive control. So we see both the criminology um, uh, um, discipline is really critical and also business decision making and that's something that's been been a real focus of our uh, academic research first meet the compliance requirements then expand so some people think that they need to develop this 25-year HACCP plan for food fraud right away that's not the case really you just need to get started and when you get started you start to identify where you do need to go deeper and and sometimes there's some really interesting perspectives such as maybe a company has a very low fraud opportunity but didn't really realize it in other cases there's this this methodical assessment identifies some really important really critical needs that that lead to say the crisis management team meeting right away so now, what to do if we're addressing the title of the evolution of food fraud prevention? <sighs> do I need to act? So that's the first one. So yeah, you should, but uh, you know, I should have had a salad for lunch. <laughs> um, and so um, do you, what do you actually have to do? And that's something that we're seeing with GFSI now, that the key is GFSI is requiring at least a high level uh, con uh, company-wide vulnerability assessment. It's not requiring a lot of detail yet. Things like um, having subject matter experts um, instead of uh, a, a big HACCP type um, testing plan. So do need to act is the first, the first action. Second is how to start. So wow, that's such a simple question, but really complex. So you know you need to do something, what do you do? How do you do it? How many people are involved? Do you need approvals for more people's time? Do you need to hire people? So how to start is another, another um, area of, of our research, which leads to a couple things. Is one is what to do. So that could be any countermeasures or control systems. You know, here are a lot of suppliers that do authenticity testing or traceability. Um, which ones do you need to do? 
Next is how to manage new information. So we're getting a lot of new incidents. So say that there's a new incident to look at how that information is digested. This is starting to look at how that actual strategy works. How much is enough? It's a real key point. And, and for companies that are, that are also selling uh, technologies, that someone has to make a decision to buy. So you could have a great new product, but if people don't have a decision-making process, if they don't realize that's something that they should do, if they don't realize that they do need to act, then, then there's a real challenge there. So this gets into the business decision-making and enterprise risk management. How to measure defend success. So any new systems in place really need to have some metrics. And they need to have a, a targets at first of what is success and then how you can defend or define that. Think about a HACCP program and quality management. Originally, uh, we just measured defects at the end of a, of a line, of a production line. Now we're managing the root causes that could lead to anomalies that could lead to uh, nonconformances. So that's where something where we find different types of critical control points. Uh, before ending, I'd just like to thank a lot of people, and BRC as well has been an excellent partner. Really I've enjoyed our time together. I've learned a lot, and uh, really I'm glad to be here and uh, look forward to continued involvement. But a lot of people, especially at Michigan State, have been very supportive, and I really appreciate a lot of the help from everybody. Also, there's a lot of ways you can engage with us. We've got our MOOCs as, as a core starting point, graduate courses, multi-client studies, and other types of executive education. So feel free to contact us if you have any questions. With that, I'll say thank you and take questions.